Okay, so our presentation today um, is about the is, is entitled The Best Practice Recommendations for Using Music with Children and Young People with Disorders of Consciousness. So this is a bit of a background to the presentation. So I'm going to provide you with a short, a brief background to these best practice recommendations that we have been compiling, um, followed by uh, an introduction to the population, which will be presented by Professor Wendy McGee. And then um, we will talk about the sensory stimulation in intervention programs, which I think Valerie uh, will present on. Then we will look at selecting and using music for auditory stimulation, uh, how families have been involved and, the, and caregivers in, in the care uh, and therapeutic activities and leisure. And then finally, Anna will reveal the recommendations for music's role within auditory environment. And we'll provide some time at the end for questions. We're hoping to be able to do all this within an hour. We may slightly go over, but we'll try and keep to that one hour. Okay. So just um, to introduce us. So, well, I'm Jonathan Poole. I am a senior research fellow at um, Anglia Ruskin University at the Cambridge Institute for Music Therapy Research. Um, and I'm also a researcher at the Children's Trust, which is a, a, a specialist paediatric neurorehabilitation unit uh, in the UK, in Surrey in the UK. Um, Professor Wendy McGee is an experienced clinician, teacher and researcher in music therapy and one of the world's leading authorities on music therapy for disorders of consciousness. She is one of the original developers of the music therapy uh, assessment uh, tool for awareness in disorders of consciousness or MATADOC and a co-conspirator in the development and validation of uh, the paediatric version of that tool called the Musica, which is the music therapy sensory instrument for cognition, consciousness and awareness. She is professor at Temple University in Philadelphia. Dr. Valerie Pasch uh, uh, is a, a licensed psychologist with the paediatric psychology program in the Department of Behavioral Psychology, the director of the postdoctoral fellowship training in that department and director of the behavioral sleep services in the sleep disorder clinic at Kennedy Krieger Institute in Baltimore. She is also an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at the John Hopkins University School of Medicine. Anna Menon, uh, Anna Menon Sanchez uh, from Barcelona in Spain is an experienced psychologist and music therapist based at the Gutmann Institute in Barcelona. And uh, this is actually her um, brainchild, I suppose, uh, this, this, this whole presentation and documents that we've been creating. And lastly, Janine Bauer, who is not presenting with us, but is a co-author in these recommendations, is an experienced music therapist at the Royal Children's Hospital in Melbourne and a PhD student uh, at, the, at Melbourne University, who is specialising in uh, music for paediatric uh, disorders of consciousness. So. I'm going to give you a short background to these recommendations. So these began um, from clinical work uh, early on, a few years ago. Uh, Anna and I got talking and she was inspired by some of the work that she was doing. Um, and she realized that there were that the families and the co-workers looking after children with disorders of consciousness had um, great needs for information in how to use music. She wanted to share that knowledge more widely beyond her initial team um, and so that other people could benefit from the experiences that we have as music therapists and people that use music on a daily basis. So we were chatting and um, then we decided that it would be a good idea to bring together a team. So we brought together this team of five people that I've already introduced you to we decided as a team that we would create two documents. One would be a review of the literature about using music with children and young people with disorders of consciousness, a review of the evidence, whatever we could find. And we also decided that not only would there need to be something published in um, hopefully a peer-reviewed journal, um, 
that we would also want to create a document that was more accessible to anybody. And this would be something we would call the practical document or the practical recommendations. And this would be for anyone interested in using music for children and young people with disorders of consciousness. So it was uh, more of some guidelines. Now, the first document is now it has been accepted for publication in music and medicine. So look out for that when it comes out. And the second document will be provided to institutions around the world, um, including the Children's Trust and hopefully um, the Kennedy Krieger Institute and others, uh, and obviously the Goodman Institute in Barcelona, um, and hopefully translated into different languages to be as useful as possible. So in order to produce these documents, first of all, we had to conduct a literature review um, of the use of music for children with disorders of consciousness. Um, and as I've said, this has been accepted for publication. In terms of the practical recommendations, these were to be based on the evidence from the literature and also our own clinical practice and knowledge. So that's a combination of the knowledge of music therapists and also of psychologists as well, uh, as Valerie's here and also, um, and a sort of dual, dual role in that sense. We wanted to make sure that the practical recommendations, because they're written for um, non-music therapists, that they would be reviewed by a small PPI group. Um, and these were this was um, made up of members of the PPI group from the Children's Trust, um, who are parents of children who have either had or still have acquired brain injuries. So it could be written in a sensitive way and, um, and in a way that's accessible. Our aim was to make it available globally um, and for it to be a resource for various different groups of people, including families, caregivers, educators, and professionals. And that particular document is in the final stages of refinement. So I'll hand over to uh, Professor McGee for an introduction to the population. Thanks so much, Jonathan. So we're going to be talking today about uh, disorders of consciousness that, con that comprise a continuum of these conditions listed here, spanning from coma, where there's no wakefulness and no awareness, through to vegetative state, also known as unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, where there is no evidence, the child or young person shows no evidence of awareness of themselves or their environment. So there's no interaction with others or there's no sustained or reproducible purposeful voluntary behavior responses to uh, sensory stimuli in the environment. And then coming out from vegetative state or unresponsive wakefulness syndrome, the child or young person will move into what's called minimally conscious state or MCS, where they start to show behaviors that suggest awareness of both themselves and of the environment. For example, they're showing responses that are contingent to specific environmental stimuli or behaviors that are reproducible, not just reflexive behaviors. And then hopefully uh, the child or young person will also then emerge from a disorder of consciousness known as emergence from MCS or EMCS. And this is where we start to see evidence of um, awareness, both of themselves and also their environment. They're starting to show consistent and reliable um, responses. They're able to use different objects purposefully on different occasions. And they also can start to make some choice making. They're able to show some discrimination. And most importantly, they're able to show some interactive communication as well. Um, so just to say that today we're really focusing on the levels from BS, UWS, MCS, and Emerge from MCS. We won't be talking about coma. Can we have the next slide, please, Jonathan? So just to uh, give a brief introduction to the complicating factors for caring with child, for, for children and young people with a disorder of consciousness. First of all, these young folk don't have any means for verbal communication or even necessarily gestural communication. So they can't tell us what they want, how they feel, whether they're in pain, no means for communication. And this is um, compounded by um, 
often undiagnosed or certainly underdiagnosed sensory impairments. So the child may actually have cortical visual impairment and we don't even know that. They may be hypersensitive to tactile stimuli. So a lot of sensory impairments going on there. They also a tip, will typically have limited or non-purposeful movement or even no movement at all. Their responses are likely to be inconsistent. So we're not seeing them repeated on different occasions. They're likely to have quite profound cognitive impairments, variable arousal, so they'll be asleep for a lot of the time, but awake for short periods. Um, medical vulnerability, so it means that they may have periods when they're out of their rehab because they need to have medical um, needs taken care of. And then also um, limbic responses, so responses where we're not too sure whether these are purposeful or whether these are to do with internal stimulation. Thanks. I'm going to pass on, sorry, to, I'm so sorry, I'm going to pass on to uh, Dr. Valerie Pash to talk about sensory stimulation for children and young people with DOC. Thank you, Wendy. All right, next slide, slide please, Jonathan. So in addition to some of those complicating factors that Wendy talked about, we also know that when we're working with children, they're not just young um, versions of an adult, and that we also really have to take those developmental pieces into mind. One of the first things to think about is where the child was developmentally before their injury happened, and whether they potentially already had a developmental delay before then they were further impacted. We have to think about the timeline of developmental milestones, especially when we're considering motor language um, and some of those like cognitive and attention related skills so that we're able to better adjust our approach. We also have to think about developmental approaches to assessment and kind of recognizing that we will assess and interact with a two year old very differently than we will with a 13 year old. And again, kind of being mindful of some of those adaptations. And then really thinking about the appropriateness of stimuli. A lot of the assessments that are done with our youth with disorders of consciousness involve things like a bell or ammonia smell or things that have absolutely no relevancy to the children that we're working with. So really kind of thinking about um, in our role as therapists, music therapists, psychologists, ensuring that we're choosing some very child appropriate items uh, for our our patients. All right, next please. So there's also research out there that really kind of emphasizes the importance of this personally relevant stimuli, even in our youth um, and adults with disorders of consciousness. So while this is primarily based on research done with an adult population, there is more of this emerging evidence that showing that some of these conclusions and differentiations do in fact apply to our children with disorders of consciousness. So research has shown that there can be an ability to differentiate between familiar voices and strangers' voices, especially when it comes to parents and caregivers that people with disorders of consciousness are able to differentially respond to their own name, as well as to personally meaningful music that they may be exposed to. That they're also able to differentiate between preferred sounds and olfactory or smell stimuli. And then they're also able to differentially respond um, to familiar faces, particularly when we're thinking about family members. All right. And so because we know that there is this importance for personally relevant items, we also know there is this potential for differentiation. It kind of leads us to really thinking about sensory stimulation. And the goal here is that we want to be sure that even for our youth with DOC, that they still have a really sensory rich environment in order to help promote arousal, to help promote their responsiveness, and really overall to just kind of think about quality of life. For the most part, there aren't many counterindications to using sensory stimulation or kind of providing those um, sensory experiences to our uh, people with DOC. 
Um, in general, sensory stimulation is pretty inexpensive, it's not harmful, it's not invasive, and it's usually pretty simple, um, just kind of by gathering items and presenting them to the person. We do have to be mindful of overstimulation and ensuring that we are providing opportunities for rest, as well as being mindful of habituation and ensuring that we are kind of varying the items or the experiences that we're providing so that they continue to be meaningful for the person. All right, next please, Jonathan. So as a psychologist, one of the things that we do is really kind of look at behaviorally based ways to decide what items to use from that sensory stimulation or personally relevant um, perspective. And one of the ways that we go about doing that is with something called a preference assessment, which is just kind of a more formalized way of approaching um, finding out items that a person may respond to or prefer when they don't have the verbal capabilities to tell us. So we know that the um, methodology here is based in applied behavior analysis, primarily based on those behavioral observations. So that kind of started us off with step one for how to gather our information. And then our group at Kennedy Krieger wanted to adapt that math methodology, particularly for children and adolescents with DOC, um, and finding a very structured way to go about identifying items they might respond to based on their pre-injury preferences and their post-injury presentation. So our starting point with this is just kind of talking to um, the staff, the caregivers, the people who are working with our child with DOC to find out if there have been any items the child seems to have responded to or interacted with in the course of their hospitalization uh, or in their kind of school or therapy experience. The second part of this item identification is using a structured interview called the Preference Assessment for Youth with Disorders of Consciousness, or the PADOC, which goes through a very structured way of trying to identify potential items to use. Right. Next, please, Jonathan. So our PADOC is available um, in the Amari 2017 article that was cited. And essentially, it's a way of kind of approaching caregivers to get as much detail as possible about the child's pre-injury preferences. As Wendy mentioned, we see a lot of variability in responding post-injury, as well as a lot of kind of unknown sensory abilities. So our goal with using the PADOC was to tap into as many different sensory domains as possible, as we're kind of thinking about items to use with the child. So basically, we go through kind of sensory domain by sensory domain with our caregivers and parents and ask them um, questions such as, some children really enjoy looking or watching at different things. This can include things like a mirror, pictures of family or celebrities, magazines, TV or videos. What are some things that you think your child most likes to look at or watch? If the caregiver identifies a preferred television show, we would further break that down and talk about, you know, whether this is something they enjoy watching on the television, on their cell phone, on a tablet, if there's a particular clip of that um, TV show that they like or a particular character that they really prefer, a favorite song that's part of the episode, kind of getting as much detail as possible to be able to best tailor the items that we're using um, as we're assessing preferences. All right, Jonathan. So kind of thinking about that, when we're selecting our items, we really want to think about some special considerations, like those sensory limitations that Wendy previously mentioned. If a child's had changes to their visual abilities, we would want to focus on some of our other sensory domains when we're thinking about that stimulation. Similarly, if a child has medical counterindications or significant agitation, we also may need to kind of further tailor the types of items that we're thinking about. 
when we're doing our preference assessment, we're kind of planning this observation that we'll do. Before presenting any sort of stimuli or items, we want to do a brief observation of the child just to kind of see what they look like at their baseline kind of initial state, looking for any motor movements, facial expressions, vocalizations, kind of anything that sort of they just present with without having any additional stimulation. We also know given the subtlety of responses, it can be really helpful to have more than one person present for these observations in data gathering. And then we're kind of ready to go about presenting the items briefly one at a time while observing the child to see any behavioral changes that we may be observing. Given the variability and inconsistency in responding, we want to be sure we're presenting each stimuli multiple times and kind of changing the order in which we're presenting them, just to ensure um, as best as we possibly can that any changes we're observing really are in response to that item. Jonathan? So from that behavioral perspective, as we're trying to identify items that the child still does prefer and respond to after their injury versus items that maybe have less of an impact than they did pre-injury and items that should at least be potentially avoided after injury due to negative responses. These are some examples of the ways we go about kind of classifying that behavior. We're often looking for those positive alerting responses, such as eye opening, smiling, turning the head, fixing visually on an item or tracking the item, having a positive calming response, such as decreased movement, relaxing of muscle tone, having no response, which we kind of code as neutral when the item is presented or having a negative response such as grimacing, crying, having behavioral posturing, pushing an item away. And that kind of helps us start to determine post-injury some of these items that the child uh, prefers or responds to. And it's also important to note that these are really subtle responses, which is kind of why we try to the best of our ability to manage that environment around the child and to do those pre-observations before we start identifying any items to use with them. We also know that post-injury, there can be some negative responses to previously preferred songs or smells or TV shows, which is, again, why it's kind of important um, to check to see how they're still responding. All right. So then I will pass this along to um, Anna Menon to talk a bit more about selecting and using music for auditory stimulation with our DOC populations. I think I might be um, uh, delivering this part of it, I think. Is that correct, Anna? Sorry, Jonathan. <laughs> That's all right. We, we, we had a bit of a chat about it, I think, at, at some point. So um, so just briefly, because um, because actually Valerie gave a really good um, and comprehensive sort of view of what's, what's important to think about. So when we select um, stimuli, uh, particularly auditory stimuli, the two key words really are familiarity and salience. And although... We have presented on this in the past, and so and I have numerous times as well. Um, we feel that actually we can't say it enough um, because this is so important in this kind of work. Um, so as long as it's careful use of preferred musical stimulation, then that, that's what the uh, Royal College of Physicians recommends. So from the evidence, we, we can say that from the literature. In terms of... Um, what happens in the brain we we know from various studies and and the the study by Schnecker is, is uh, one that um, music activates um, brain areas associated with consciousness cognition and emotional arousal that listening to music holds per that holds personal meaning can improve cognitive function uh, and this is a subtle um uh, improvement but it's it's something noticeable 
Um, uh, so particularly in a study by Castro in 2015, uh, that they published in 2015, it showed that um, patients with disorders of consciousness, uh, although it was a small sample, it still, they still showed it convincingly in the study, that they responded to the sound of their own name more frequently, more reliably after, after listening to familiar music than um, when they did not listen to familiar music. So it changed something about the way that they responded uh, or even recognised their own name. So it's a powerful feature, salience and familiarity. All right. So in terms of thinking about salient auditory stimuli, salient stimuli um, activate limbic structures associated with um, emotional processing, amongst other things. Um, it activates the frontal parietal network, the default mode network, and of course the salience network as well. It increases responsiveness in um, MCS patients, that's minimally conscious um, patients, and it can elicit, elicit changes in both at both behavioural and neural levels um, uh, also. Interestingly, it shows different kinds of responses. So when using salient auditory stimuli, um, this can improve arousal for um, people in uh, vegetative state or unresponsive wakefulness syndrome. Um, but it can show uh, increases in attention for people uh, in a minimally conscious state. And uh, salient auditory stimuli also activate brain areas associated with reward and um, autobiographical um, memories as well, which I think is quite key in this. And something that you might see um, quite commonly in other populations, for example, dementia. So in terms of um, music in the typically developing um, human being and its relevance to sensory stimulation, uh, this is from uh, Ginny Bauer's work and her one part of her contribution to our, uh, our writing. And so infants have an innate capacity for musical processing. Uh, and I think as music therapists, we this is one of, one of the fundamental um, building blocks really of our of our profession and probably for uh, other professions that also use music um, as a way of working with very young children so it's it's uh, music processing uh, it, children are able to process it um, and its fundamental elements from an early age um, but as as Janine has shown us in previous presentations that uh, ability to process music alters over time it's uh, so the in terms of being able to complex uh, process more complex music that develops. So uh, an infant isn't automatically able to process all music uh, and in, in all its complexity. Infants use their inherent communicative musicality as the basis for their first social encounters with caregivers. And yes, again, this is a, a fundamental uh, theory, really, uh, that underlies a lot of uh, improvisation in music therapy itself and that, that it is innately uh, part of our communicative musicality. So some of the things that are really important to, important to consider when we're selecting music is about prior musical experience. It may be useful um, in the process of helping somebody recover. So thinking about whether they played a musical instrument depending on how old they are what kind of music they listen to, their musical experiences in the family, listening to music in the car, things like that. And I will go into more detail about the recommendations in a moment, but I'm just going to give you some, some thoughts from the literature here. So the live presentation of songs may be optimal. And the reason for this is that it allows for us to maximise arousal and awareness, because by presenting the music or the song um, live, to the patient, then we can adapt and change what's being played so that we can be responsive to their presentation, to their heartbeat, their heart rate, their breathing rate, their, um, their arousal state, and we can modify. So if, so for example, um, by presenting music uh, live, we can, we can adjust the intensity of the music if we feel that the, the patient is being overstimulated or we can increase the some aspect of the music, including the intensity, to try and raise uh, wakefulness. As music pr processing develops, 
before language processing, then it's possible that music may support arousal awareness and cognitive stimulation. Um, carefully selected music can incorporate many of the features present in sensory stimulation programs. Now these um, are in, these include music remaining simple, so the simplicity of the music. If it's too complicated, it may uh, confound any um, attention processing that might be going on. That it's important to consider the frequency and repetition and the intensity of this frequency um, when presenting uh, the music. There needs to be time to rest as well. And also that's, that's so that the stimulation doesn't become, uh, so that the patient doesn't habituate to the stimulation and show no response. That the modality of the stimulation is also important, whether touch and vision are used at the same time, and it's actually considered to be more natural and more useful to combine different types of modalities in terms of stimulation. So combining visual and touch with sound, so that a person's brain can put together the whole the whole picture. That emotional salience may also be important. That Emotional salience may be found in the, the material itself or its associations. Or, and in that way, autobiographical content may also be important. Um, and we can also think about input processing and the ecology of the setting in terms of thinking about what other stimuli are going on around at that time. I'm now going to hand over to Anna this time and um, I'll mute. Hi, thank you, Jonathan. Well, um, when we talk about family, we include caregivers beyond a child's biological family, for example, uh, foster caregivers, adoptive parents, kinship caregivers, and family-centered approach should be central. It recognizes the, um, it, because it places the child with BOC and their family at the heart of the care, and it recognizes the family unit as a recipient of healthcare. Family unit sharing the trauma loss and emotional adjustment. Please, Jonathan. Yeah. Well, the authoritative guidelines suggest several key factors to optimize the effects of rehabilitation in children and youth. And one of these factors is the working, uh, the work with families. So we can see uh, promoting arousal, conducting serial assessments, using standardized behavioral assessments suitable for children, but the work with families is also key. All international guidelines for the uh, see recommend involving families and as a clinicians, uh, we can see several reasons to support this recommendation. On the one hand, family provide a valuable source of information about child's interests. Families uh, spend much of their time with the child as well, and they are often the first one to detect behavioral changes. Also, it is common to observe more responses during patient-family interactions than during patient-staff interactions. Even if we look at the assessments, involving caregivers in assessments has been found to improve behavioral outcomes and even result in higher outcomes of awareness. So what, what happened in, what's happening with the families? This is a such hard process. This is a hard, uh, such hard situation to live. So a child's injury results in a sudden change um, uh, to the family dynamic, requiring much adjustment for parents and siblings. The burden to families is both practical in terms of change of roles uh, within the family system, but also is emotional as, uh, as, as they uh, need to adjust to the loss of hopes and dreams associated with a typical developmental child and also put all the child and family plans on hold and, and make them to reconsider all the future expectations. So also it has been found that family burden uh, is it may be more prevalent in, for, for parents that, we, that perceive that in the unmet healthcare. So it's something to look at. Families of child uh, with DOC experience a complex loss and grief process. They are informed about the severity of the injury. Also, they are told that they don't know when it's going to recover the child, for how long it's going, how long it's going to take, and how it's going to be the, the prognosis. The, so the, the, the severity of the sequelae 
they are remaining uncertain. And through this hard process of the adjustment and acceptance, family members may pass through different stages involving a range of emotional reactions. The initial shock when they are admitted can be involved uh, can involve anguish, confusion, and frustration, and may switch, uh, switch uh, to feelings of hope or with relief, optimism about recovery, denial, and may evolve to feelings of depression, rage, guilt, until um, and this is so. This is something to 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 be very you know, looking at and and understanding this process it may help professionals to develop guidance and support alongside with the coping uh, um, styles strategies. So, um, uh, sorry, the strategies of coping. Emotional focus uh, strategies and aim to manage stress through processes such as denial. And um, problem action strategies aim to alter the stressful situations, for example, seeking information. It has been found that uh, emotion focused strategies uh, correlate with greater psychological distress and can have a reciprocal effect on child's functioning, resulting in poorer outcomes. So this is key to develop guidelines that promote problem action uh, focused strategies. And involving families in the delivery of sensory stimulation seems that it's a good way to promote problem action focused coping strategies. Yes, can, can you? So we have, uh, it can, uh, it may empower parents uh, and siblings to play and interact. Families may need support to learn how to interact and, and also um, may validate them and families member interaction, may help them to feel secure in their interactions and encourage them to take a more active role in their child's orientation. And most important, importantly, interactions elicited can work towards reinforcing uh, family efficiency bonding. When they are involved, families can develop a better understanding of the child's behavior repertoire. And all of this uh, in turn can contribute to the family's adjustment to the situation and improve percep perceptions of healthcare needs being met. So Jonathan. All right, thank, thank you, Anna. So uh, and there's just a couple of slides from me now uh, as a sort of an interruption to, to Anna's um, presentation of slides here. And that's just because um, we felt that it was important to just come back to thinking about why are we talking about leisure activities for children with disorders of consciousness? We're talking about a patient group who we don't know uh, often certainly when, when they are um, very severely uh, um, affected and early on when they might be in a unresponsive wakefulness state or, or, or vegetative state, that we're not sure whether they're even aware of uh, our presence in the room because they're unable to show us. It doesn't mean that we assume that they don't um, know or that they're not aware, but we have to, but we're not sure. And that's quite key. And so when thinking about this, when we're thinking about the people who provide that care, what's the situation that they are faced with on a daily basis, the nursing and care teams, and all of the professionals that might work around this child, and also, of course, the family. So um, we thought we'd bring in Article 31 from the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, which states that we recognize the right of the child to rest and leisure and to engage in play and recreational activities appropriate to their age. And so that is part of their rights. And so in thinking about this, um, we just sort of want to put it to you to think about, because it's a great, it's a great, um, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to work with, with, uh, with somebody who, doesn't respond very much to what you do where you have to look for those subtle signs that Barry was talking about and that Wendy was talking about. And uh, and that can really challenge us when we are caring for them. But we have to come back to that question of humanity and our own sense of humanity. And you're thinking about in the absence of certainty, what do you assume when you're working in that situation? Do you just fall back on, well, they're not really responding, so therefore 
there's probably not much point in doing a lot or do you still maintain that hope and as, and assume that they might actually know that you're there and he can hear what you're saying in, in which case you might think about the kind of conversations you might have in front of them and what and how you present yourself and present the stimuli so i just wanted to bring that in and i'll hand back to to anna for the final part of the presentation okay so thanks jonathan well um i'm going to sum up uh, um, the recommendations we have been working on so first of all um the document uh, is structured in three main blocks one is Preparation, the second is implementation, and the third, contraindications. First, firstly, we need to stress the importance of the preparation. Yeah, before starting any activity with a child or young person, uh, it's very important to maximize the potential uh, of the responses to respond and to participate. So the preparation is very crucial. And um, for doing that, we suggest taking into account three main aspects. Okay, first of all, constructing an optimal sensory environment. If possible, it's easy. Choose a quiet location. Uh, consider the pre-existing uh, level of um, uh, the sound. Uh, sorry, the pre-existing sound level of the environment. So um, minimize the sounds that may compete for the child's own personal attention. Uh, like turning off the TV or radio, turning down the tablet or the mobile phones, uh, minimizing the, the noise from outside the room, closing the door. Plan a moment where there's a reduced risk of interruptions. It's not a good moment during feeling times or um, lunch time. Uh, it's not a moment before um, medication time. Uh, support optimal comfort and comfort. With this population, it's very important in the positioning to check the body is well aligned and the child is uh, comfortable to, um, to facilitate the participation. And, and if not, readjust the position. Then leave rest periods before and after um, any activity. We suggest 30 minutes. And um, keep activity short. Uh, from 15 to 25 minutes. Um, also alternate periods of music stimulation with periods of rest. This is something that sometimes for families is hard because mm, sometimes uh, mm, we have in mind that we need to stimulate, stimulate, stimulate and, and rest as Valerie was, um, was saying before is as important as and, and it's very crucial. Um, to let the person participate and maximize their responses. So, and I, I want to highlight the selecting music, musical activities uh, aspect, as is some of the questions that people uh, usually ask, like, what can we do? So, um, please, can you move the... Okay, thank you. Well, Jonathan uh, was um, reviewing this, and, just want to remark the importance of using familiar and civil stimuli and music. So this is very, very important. Choose whatever uh, the child or a young person loves it and loves, or was important for the family relationship. Um, so second thing, try to establish an understanding of the premorbid relation with music by asking relatives curious about pre-injury preferences and previous music family use. So for example, with children, it would be interesting to know uh, about how the family use uh, the music together, in the car, at home, uh, was part of the daily routine, or perhaps uh, it, it was a part of the shared activity, like um, singing together, playing together, dancing. Um, with young people, it's, it's good to, um, to know how they were engaged. Like if they listen to the music, or when socializing, or showering, or during whole day, or the whole day, if they were playing any instrument, or attending to concerts, or just dancing, playing, how they, they engage with the music. And then 
also, uh, there were possible conduct and assessment to identify auditory preferences. I think Valerie covered a lot this part and it's good because can guide uh, families and can guide um, uh, all the team. To, for example, sometimes, as she said, there's some instruments or there's some sounds that uh, when I play the, the child or the young person shows distress. So uh, and it's good to and to um, check in the music that the preferences that they have and the reactions. I had a, um, sometimes the preferences that well, then I covered it before. I'm going to move and trying to gain information about um, information and consider relevant musical and non-musical cultural aspects, like for example, um, um, religion, ethnicity. Um, any aspect that ca can can impact um, or um, identity gender um, and this uh, and perhaps there's some religions that they use music differently or in another context. So this is important um, to know and, and to and then to then if we want to provide some recommendations. Uh, different musical activities can be done. We can sing songs, listening to recorded music, playing instruments, use uh, of apps and electric instruments, uh, toys that facilitate cause effect play. So um, when I was saying that is important is because perhaps some families or some family members don't feel comfortable doing any of um, any uh, certain activity, for example, singing. So we can do other things. So the important thing is that the family or who or the carer who is doing the the, uh, the activity feels comfortable doing whatever they are doing uh, and enjoying it too. So uh, I will stress this that, that it's important everybody who's doing a stimulation, uh, doing uh, playing music together, I enjoy the activity that is doing with the, the child or the, or the young person with the OC. And also it's important to select age appropriate activities. So sometimes there's the belief that the person is really learning, is really learning and, um, and can be the risk of using some music that is not appropriate for the age. So it's important to take it into account. Okay, can you please move? Yeah. Okay, with the implementation, there's several aspects to take into account. Uh, perhaps I will I will talk a little bit more about the use of auditory stimulation intentionally, but I will um, I will start uh, talking about the thinking about the wakefulness. Ideally, it's good. It would be good that the person is uh, is um, showing uh, um, is awake or, or when we introduce music. Or perhaps when we want that we follow this is the desired outcome. Okay, but I always try, I recommend that it's important to, to respect and to try to, to use music when the child or the young person is, is, um, is awake. Um, presenting the stimuli, we provide some, some tips about how to present the, the music. Uh, like informing the uh, child or adult about what is going to happen, uh, using um, the kind of language, using minimal spoken language, avoiding frequent rapid repetitions of the speech uh, when talking to child in person, allowing extra time to focus on process information provided, also allowing extra prompts when using musical instruments or objects. Uh, also, we give tips about where to place the stimuli present always in the middle line of the child's own personal visual gaze. Sometimes it's not here, it's here. That depends on, so we need to assess and see what is the, the, the middle line. And also considering the proximity. You know, it's, uh, sometimes children need a kind of proximity here, not over there. And this is important to, to take into account. Also, it's important to be aware of any behavioral change that happens. Meanwhile, uh, we are providing the stimulation while we are doing the activity. And when we, we feel appropriate, we could consider using assistive technology to promote active participation. Then, um, I, I said that I will, I will talk in a minute about the use of auditory stimulation intentionally, about managing emotional responses. 
we can see sometimes uh, um, emotional responses like a smiling, laughing, crying, grimacing, and we need to be very careful and um, observe if it is happening, like the consistency and the contingency of these responses. So in order to, the, to see if it's because of the music or it's not because of the music or if it happens sometimes or not. And um, so it is important to, to check this. And also if we see there's any response that is not uh, cool, like we can see that episode of performance associated with a certain stimuli is, or a certain music is better not to use it. And when we talk about involving others, uh, this is nice whenever it's possible to involve parents, siblings, and carers. And um, when using when music is used by different people during the day, it would be recommended that the share list of preferred songs and musical instruments uh, is available, and to kind of have a, a diary or a report about what music is used in order to not use the same song over and over and uh, have a little bit of variety. So, Jonathan, please, can you move? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So, with the use of uh, auditory stimuli intentionally. Um, we, okay, music, we can use music in, in many different ways. And this part is a little bit to highlight this aspect. We can, we can combine auditory stimulation with other sensory input, and that can support to make more meaningful and real um, the stimuli and this experience, and to make more similar to the real life situations. So um, perhaps we can encourage the expression of choice where it's possible, like, do you want me to play this chimes or this rainmaker? Or, or, and, and we can observe if there's differences in the responses. Uh, also, it's important to match the musical experience to what we are hoping to achieve. If we want to work developing towards um, or um, developing communication, or we want to increase awareness, or we want to support relaxation, we can use many music different in a, in a many different ways. Also, uh, also it's important to use the use of music in shared leisure time and with, with families, and we can use music. Uh, that was meaningful in the relationship or and to help and, and there are many sense okay like okay this song that we were listening to the travel that we did several years ago to whatever or um, any anything that helps to that links to the, the person um, to, with the child so or with the young um, uh, person so, and also uh, use music to construct, and we can use music to construct a positive auditory environment, like masking extraneous noise with multisensory experiences and to avoid noises that are not nice in the environment. So can you move? Yeah. And at the end, we talk a little bit about the contraindications. So before Valerie was mentioning, uh, the overstimulation and the risk of overstimulation and the habituation. So although every person is different, we need to be aware about the signs, like change of color, the skin, sweating, an increase of the respiration, frequency, agitation, perhaps someone closes the eyes, other people increase uh, the uh, level of alertness or uh, opens the eyes um, or increase the muscle tone. So when we see any of these signs, we should uh, um, stop the music and immediately. Also, it's, it's good not to use the music as a background uh, when a task requires concentration and, not, and uh, when they are doing a task that requires uh, concentration or um, being aware of the changes of uh, volume or predictive changes in the music. For example, if we are listening to the radio and the repetitive sounds, like not having like uh, this kind of start, uh, startle reactions. Um, so also don't tell, uh, try not to tell anyone we are listening to music in order to help the person to refocus. Uh, and watching for the habituation, uh, we, we would recommend not playing music constantly, we need to rest. Also, if loss of attention is observed, 
we um, would be good perhaps to have a break and try again and also uh, uh, try to vary the styles of music that we listen to and the activities we are listening and doing. It's a good way to avoid the, the, the habituation. So this uh, would be uh, the sum up of the, the different recommendations that um, we've been working on. And, and if you have any question. Okay, thank you very much, Anna. And um, also thank you to, to Wendy and Valerie. Um, it's been a great pleasure and a privilege to work uh, with you all and with Janine on this, uh, this particular project. So um, I am going to just throw it open to uh, uh, the, the attendees to see if there are any questions for us. So you can either use the chat or the question and answer, depending on um, what you find easier, really, for the moment. And I'll try and keep an eye on this. I was uh, just a question while we're just question to you, uh, all you three, really, just in terms of overstimulation. I have known um, sometimes uh, for um, younger patients to um, to have a seizure when there is too much. Or and so I'm sort of a, and my assumption at the time as a clinician was that there was too much noise or that, that it was too loud or it was too sudden. And that causes a startle seizure, I think. Would you call that overstimulation? Is that an example of what could happen, do you think? Uh, I don't know the others. Uh, I would uh, say I would recommend to have further investigations about seizures and when are happening, because perhaps could be elicited by a high level sounds or not. And, and first we will need to check the nature of the, why, uh, so um, to have some studies about when it's happening, when the seizures are happening. But definitely I will try to not be very loud and with a patient with seizures. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm just wondering, that's a very interesting response. Um, and I'm just wondering with the psychologists in the room, um, whether it might be, uh, whether you have any advice for clinicians and others who had notice a behaviour and are wondering if they can find out how to find out what it, you know, what it means or whether it's related to anything that's happening. And what would you do in that situation? Sure. So I'm happy to kind of start chiming in on this one and others can join in if they'd like. Um, I think data collection is one of the really big things that we do. Whenever we notice a new behavior, whenever we notice like escalating agitation, we try to take note of what's going on in the environment at that time. Because sometimes it's related to medication changes. Sometimes it's related to like internal pain or discomfort. So I think the data collection is sort of the first piece and then communication is the second piece. So kind of talking to anybody else who's involved with the child's care to see um, if they're in the hospital, are the physicians seeing this? Are the physicians concerned for seizure activity? Have they just made a medication change? Um, are the parents seeing this at home? If the child's at school, are there certain times of day that they're seeing similar things? Because I think a lot of the time we're having to put our detective hats on because the child isn't able to tell us and isn't able to answer questions. So so it's that piece of collaboration and then also the piece with the data. Um, and if we're noticing any patterns of kind of ill responses or um, aversive responses, taking a break from whatever that potential trigger is and seeing if that eliminates the behavior that we're seeing. And if so, that tells us it likely was the contributor. If we continue to see that response from the child, then that lets us know perhaps it's more in response to an internal stimuli as opposed to something in the environment. How long would you need to find that out 
aspects. So when you're talking about gathering the data, I'm sort of thinking, well, over what period of time would you would you study the the, the, the patient to, to try and find out the meaning behind some of these behaviours? So I think the, the short answer is it depends. <laughs> um, just kind of noting that the variability in the disorders of consciousness population. Um, often on our team, like when we're doing the preference assessments, if we see two negative responses, we stop with that item that we would rather kind of err on the side of caution and say, maybe I'm accidentally, you know, removing a stimuli that's not having a negative impact as opposed to inadvertently continuing to present something that has a negative response. And then often, you know, we may come back and try again a different day or a week later. Um, and that's where we would communicate with others to kind of see if anybody else has seen that similar response. Thanks a lot, Valerie, for, for us to that. Um, we have a question from Richard Parker. He says, uh, thank you for a very interesting webinar. I have a rather specific question for the panel. John referred to very subtle signs which observers of clients with disorders of consciousness may be seeking. Could such signs extend to the detection of micro expressions? In other words, expressions lasting under half a second or from one was that one twenty fifth of a second to one fifth of a second? Um, depending on, or is that, yeah, I think that might be a quarter to a half of a second uh, to the definition of what adults. Um, so these are very subtle or very quick signs, these micro expressions, I think. Um, and he mentioned that a trial is being conducted uh, by the Centre Hospitalier de uh, Saint-Étienne. Um, and that's investigating whether micro expressions can occur in patients emerging from a coma. So what are, what are your thoughts about um, could such signs extend to these, these subtle signs that we're talking about? Are, how short are they? Can they be very, very brief? And what does that mean? Wendy, please. Oh, yeah. Well, I, I'm going to say something and maybe then introduce some, um, pass it back maybe to Valerie and Anna and yourself. But I think in what we just heard um, with Valerie's um, response and throughout our presentation, and even within this question itself, I think what's important is looking for patterns demonstrating patterns and making really good observations and looking for repetitions of behaviors. Um, how long can these expressions be? I mean, I, I don't even know how one would observe a fifth or a, or a 20th of a second. Um, clearly, uh, the, the person asking has some ways of measuring that. Um, so that's just my thought there is whether these, you know, first of all, determining whether these are contingent to some type of stimulus or event, and then showing that through patterns of responsiveness. But I'm very interested to hear what Anna and Valerie might have to say, and you, Jonathan, too. I can add something to that. So um, just to, to give Anna and Valerie a, a chance to collect the thoughts. Um, so. I think the, the question is, it's also whether it's meaningful, because when we're working with, um, which is essentially what uh, Wendy was, was saying really is, is, you know, what does it mean? Is, it imp is, it, is this kind of response uh, a meaningful response? And what does it mean? When we are um, observing responses, there are types of responses that we're looking for that mean something and other types of responses that are more reflexive. So, a reflexive response, as the word suggests, is is a response that is um, it's not cognitively mediated. It's not controlled. It just happens. So that could be pupil dilation. It can also, in terms of disorders of consciousness, be um, a quick eye movement to to, the, to towards the stimulus. Um, and if it's very quick, we tend to associate that with um, 
well, quick, brief movements on responses to reflexive responses. In other words, that was not controlled by a person. So that's not going to be a sign of awareness, or it's not indicative of a sign of awareness. Um, whereas slower, controlled responses, and maybe where they're perhaps with someone's tracking movement around, that's a much longer response, much much beyond your micro expressions that you're talking about, Richard, which we, we would then uh, associate it with more cognitively mediated and meaningful responses. So I suppose it is possible that microaggression, uh, micro, micro expressions and micro behaviours occur. Um, however, I'm not sure uh, in terms of whether we would use them as meaningful um, responses. Right. And I agree with what Jonathan said. Um, as a psychologist, first of all, I'm thinking about the patterns and the behavior. And then I'm thinking about what will I do with it. And when working with disorders of consciousness, we're often using those sensory stimulation items or items identified from the preference assessments to think about shaping communication, promoting alertness, providing reinforcement, or providing distraction for medical cares or event weaning or things like that. So we would typically focus a bit more on kind of that meaningful piece of the behavior and that we may be observing very subtle signs or changes, but then how are we going to translate that? Yeah, the thing is about uh, sub, uh, these um, micro expressions, we, we should define what this micro expression means. And um, also there's yes, the meaning, uh, I think I'm agree very, um, and with Jonathan, it's like we, we need to differentiate about if it's a reflexive uh, um, response or is not reflexive and when it's happening, and if this contingent or not contingent, also making something general is difficult because um, there's many different or patterns of response depending on the, uh, the injury in the, in the fashion, the facial expression. And sometimes it's, it's complicated to establish a kind of uh, general pattern for patients. It's like case by case and seeing the responses and seeing if it's something contingent or it's in response to, to something and when it's happening. So um, is that, uh, it would be tricky to differentiate or we need to look at to see if it's a reflexive response or if it's something cognitive mediated. Okay, thanks very much. Thanks, thanks. Uh, thank you to all the panelists for contributing to Anna, Wendy and Valerie. Um, well, there's another question. Let me just see. Okay, so it's just Richard. He says, uh, not just Richard, but it's, it's Richard responding. Thank you for the replies. Micro expressions can in principle be de detected on a video subject, video subject to sufficient frame rate. Um, however, as you suggest, detecting is one meta, interpreting is quite another entirely. Okay, if there are no further questions, um, any members of the panel would like to ask a question at all no okay then in which case i would like to thank you so much for your time uh today this evening this morning wherever you are in the world um and thank you to all the attendees uh for for coming to this presentation as well and um i'd like to just say thanks and and goodbye now and just a little reminder that you will receive a survey link and it would be great to um, know your feedback and to yeah for our next uh, webinar and we'll be delighted to have you join us for our next webinar as well which will be on the 16th of January 2023 and uh, Neil Evans, Christopher Stanbury and Grace Meadows will be presenting on music therapy and dementia to discuss uh, light up my life project that's it that, that's it yeah
nice, nice to have some sort of play out music on these in this part, don't you? Because <laughs> we don't have any of the background noise that you have when you're. Yes. <laughs> Perhaps we could sing a Christmas carol to see everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> we may need to stop the recording. Uh, yes, that's a, that's a good point. <laughs>